unsupervised or really uh, less monitors than the classic Windows War. And did we find this target, Xavier? So yeah, so we, we feel that CI-CD pipeline will actually check most of those boxes. Uh, the first thing we can talk about is that DevOps teams usually come with a agility mindset, uh, meaning that in, well, at least it sometimes translates within DevOps teams uh, as less security policy, less monitoring, and more freedom to set up whatever they want. Uh, what we've seen in some of our previous audits went as far as DevOps teams becoming actually another IT teams within the information systems with their own budget, their own systems, and overall they were doing whatever they wanted. Uh, so I wouldn't call that shadow IT at this point, but rather actually shadow information systems within the information systems, which as you can guess, will come with tons of uh, security issues that are very, very interesting for attackers and pen testers. Another thing which is not always necessarily the case, but we feel that DevOps teams will usually uh, take advantage of new type of infrastructure, such as Kubernetes, such as cloud provider and things like that, which are in our experience less supervised, less monitored than on-premise infrastructure. Another thing to keep in mind is that you cannot manage, you cannot administrate cloud infrastructure as you would do on on-premise infrastructure. And what we've seen uh, in the past is that there is a lack, for example, of cloud expertise within the DevOps teams, meaning that they made a transition from on-premise infrastructure towards cloud infrastructure, but they don't really know how that works and what are the risks, security risks that comes with it. So what we've seen is that uh, within the DevOps teams, there will usually tons of security issues and security misconfiguration that will be obviously very interesting for us. And the last thing quite interesting when we talk about CI CD pipeline is that, well, there is to, the, the CD means that at some point there is deployment. So at some point within your pipeline, you will need to have credentials, you will need to have to some type of access that will allow the pipeline to deploy in production. Meaning that if you successfully compromise the pipeline, you now have access to production environments, and as we will try to show you today, sometimes you can have access to even more than that and the whole information system. So what we wanted to share with you today uh, is actually a real life scenario uh, that we've performed on CI-CD pipelines. Um, just a quick disclaimer before we start, CI-CD pipeline will come with tons of different flavors. <laughs> Depending on the technical stack that you might be using, obviously, uh, you might not completely reflect what we will be talking about today. Uh, please keep in mind that while the very technical steps to compromise different technology might vary, uh, the overall methodology will honestly roughly be the same and the problematics will be quite similar. And last thing, we don't have that much time. We have 45 minutes, something like that. So we will have to go quickly over some of the subjects. Uh, but if you're really interested in it, feel free to come talk with us at the end of the talk. Or I think we have a workshop tomorrow morning, if I'm not wrong. So for those of you who will participate in it, we'll be able to talk a little bit more in depth of those different steps. So the first thing that you might do uh, when you want to pen test the security pipeline is, how do I get in? I'm an external attacker. How can I successfully obtain initial access within the pipeline? So the first thing we might want to we want to talk about is the dependency confusion or dependency hijacking. Uh, we will talk about this later on, but it's a type of vulnerability where you are able to trick the pipeline to download a malicious package from the internet, uh, and you will be able to execute this package within the pipeline. Another type of vulnerability is well weak passwords. It applies to, to CIC pipeline, but it's pretty much applied to everything all over the world. But if you have exposed assets, cloud solution used within your pipeline on which you have weak security configuration, weak password policy, and no multi-factor authentication, it can be used by an attacker, obviously, to obtain access within the pipeline, to find secrets, and sometimes to pivot within the pipeline. The last one, which might be interesting, and we've uh, used it actually quite a few times, is you might have S3 bucket, for example, containing artifacts 
that might still have secrets within it, and again, it might be a way to get within the pipeline. However, after that said, what we feel and what we want to share with you based on our experience is that CI-CD pipelines are very interesting if you want to escalate your privilege within the information systems, but we, however, do not feel that they are a very efficient way to obtain initial access within the information systems. We feel that there are classical way, I would say, that are more efficient and quicker to obtain. Uh, we can talk about phishing, uh, even physical intrusion or exposed assets with vulnerability. Honestly, we feel that it's sometimes easier to use those than to try to really focus on the pipeline itself. Just a quick word uh, after saying that, actually last week there was uh, something that came to light, which is um, 35k uh, repository or 35k hits on GitHub on basically a bad guy that fork known projects and add malicious code within it, hoping that somebody would download them and run them. So these, ty these type of thing, thing still happens. Uh, as far as I know, there is no really known impacts for now, uh, but as you can see, people still try to exploit this type of pipeline to get inside the network but we do not feel that's the most efficient way. So if we go back to a scenario, well, I called Remy and I told him, okay, give me an access within the information system. So he did his magic, he did some kind of phishing or whatever, and we were inside the pipeline. So the first thing we were interested in, interested in is how can we obtain source code? We know from experience that source code are very interesting assets because it usually contains secrets and it's a great way to escalate privilege within the information systems. So uh, obvious targets would be source code management solution. For example, GitLab or GitHub or something like that might be very interesting. So you might be able to obtain access and you might be able with anonymous access to find code, but if that's not the case, well, there are other ways to find code. You might be able to find the same source code in other parts of the pipeline. The source code actually flows in basically all the, the part of your pipeline. So you might be able to find it within a uh, scan, uh, source code scanning solution, such as Checkmark, SonarCube, and others. And you might be able to also find source code indirectly within the artifacts built by your pipeline. So even if you do not have success on the GitLab or GitHub or whatever uh, directly, please uh, try other things and you'll find that it's almost all the time easy to find one way or the other source code within the pipeline. When that's done, what you will be looking for is secrets within the pipeline. So there are multiple ways to do this, but two of the, the most efficient way we have is automated review. There are known tools we can talk about, such as GitLeak or Truffle Hogs. So these type of tools will have a detection mechanism based either on, or on entropy or a regular expression. Uh, meaning that they will be able to go over the whole repositories and tons of repositories in a quite a short amount of time. Um, but to be really efficient, they need usually need some kind of customization depending on the context. Something that an attacker and a pen tester will not be able to set up in a short amount of time. And just to give you a quick example, what you can see here on the bottom left is a .env file containing a secret, a password, the password being secure password 2021. In that example, actually all automated tools will not be able to detect it. Why so? Because this is a low entropy passwords and this actually does not match any known and any obvious regular expression. So automated tools are great, but they have blind sites and if you only use them, you will miss some type of secrets. The other thing you can do is manual review. Obviously, it's much more slower, it, uh, it's harder for the mind, but uh, you can, by searching for very specific keywords within the commits, secrets, uh, password, or thing like that, you can actually quite often find secrets that were not detected by the automated tools. And just to give you a few feedbacks on credential, uh, credential hygiene in our previous pen test, what we found is IT team, uh, an IT team with uh, one of our clients that was used GitLeak to detect secrets within the source code. So basically they had GitLeak, GitLeak setup and every time a secret was pushed on a repository, what they would do is they would remove the file, push a new commit with the removed file and 
that's it. They were not revoking the password. So obviously they were not very familiar with Git <laughs> because the only thing we had to do at that point was to search for all the commits made by the IT teams and we add a list of all the passwords that were still working within the CI CD pipeline. Another thing is that a user pushing bash history file within their uh, repository. I don't know how that can happen, but they did. And within the bash history file, we had all the comments that had been typed by the user, which was very interesting to understand how developers were interacting with our application, including obviously clear text passwords within the bash history file. And the last one uh, is I was actually one of the shortest uh, CI CD pen tests that we could perform because we arrived, they were, there was anonymous access on all the Git repository, and there were a uh, repository dedicated to Ansible, and they were using Ansible to manage service accounts within the Active Directory. And they add, in clear text, a text file containing all the passwords of all those uh, service accounts with anonymous access on their Git repository. So at that point, maybe like 20 minutes after the beginning of the pen test, we were pretty much domain admin on the Active Directory. So as you can guess, this type of vulnerability and credential hygiene is going nowhere and it's something that will be still exploitable, in our opinion, in the years to come. And uh, yes, and the last thing I want to say is that on all the source code management pen tests that we perform that contain tens or more, more repositories, we've always and always, 100% of the time, found at least one functioning and valid passwords. So what are the prevention measures that you could set up and that clients could set up within their environment? Uh, the first one is ensure that there is available secret management toolings and that developers are aware of them, are trained to use them, and know how to use them. Another thing that could be used is scan repository with automated tools that we talked about. Limit access to technical teams and from time to time, maybe perform a manual scan and manual review of the source code to ensure that you've not missed some kind of secret. There are tons of other things that you could set up and just to cite a few, what we've seen and that we feel are very interesting in some of our clients that's actually pushed fake secrets within their repository as a form of honeypot. So they were pushing false secrets within their repository and they had alert if somebody was trying to use them to know that they had an attacker within the network. So there's tons of things that you could set up to protect against that. So at that point, you now found secrets within the GitLab. And more especially, we found secrets allowing us to access the GitLab and push uh, source code to the GitLab. The next obvious target will be something called the orchestrator. I think most of you are already familiar with it, but just to remind you very quickly, the orchestrator is the main solution within the CI-CD pipeline. It's the, 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 the solution that will be in charge of pulling the source code, of building at the project, of performing the test, of deploying sometimes a project and so on. So to do so, obviously, the orchestrator needs access to a vault or to secrets to perform all these actions. In other words, if you successfully compromise the orchestrator, you've obtained all the secrets available within the CI CD pipeline. So for attacker and pen tester, it's an obvious target and a very valuable one. So to do so, there's a type of vulnerability called poison pipeline execution. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with it. Just to explain it in a few words, what is poison pipeline execution is that the orchestrator will build projects by pulling the source code from, let's say, the GitLab. In other words, if you're able to change the source code stored within the GitLab, you might be able to change what will be built and you might be able to change the different steps that will be performed to build a project. So this can be done in two ways, either directly, like you might have um, build configuration file stored within the Git repository itself. What you can see here on the bottom left is a Jenkins file. So it's a file that we detailed all the different steps that will be performed to build a project. So if the Jenkins file is stored within the repository and you can modify it, well, you can change the steps used to build a project and as such, you can add malicious steps within it. You can also do this uh, in a more indirect way, for example, by modifying makefile file, uh, adding malicious command within it, and when the, build will, when the build will be performed, 
obviously the make file will be called at some point and your malicious code will be executed. So if we take back, uh, we go back to our scenario, you push the malicious code to the repository, a webhook is sent to the orchestrator, the orchestrator will pull the, the source code and it will send the jobs to be built on one of the build nodes. Just in a few words, a build node is usually, in it's at least its best practice, is another server that will be in charge of building the project. You usually don't want to build a project directly within the master server, because if the master server gets compromised, as I said earlier, all the secrets are compromised. What we've seen, however, is that these best practices is pretty much never followed, uh, and I would say almost 100% of the time, we, are, we were successful uh, from pivoting out of the build agent back to the master server. Uh, either by having secrets within the build agent, such as SSH keys that were the same used for the master server, sometimes by having secrets within the bash history file, there's tons of ways that could allow us to pivot back to the master server, and well, hopefully for us, but bad news for DevOps. 100% of the time, we were able to compromise the master server. So the question is, once you've compromised the orchestrator, what can you do at that point? The first obvious thing that you could do is pivot out of the pipeline. Get out of the pipeline. You now have access to tons of different secrets, and I'll let Gauthier talk about that in a few seconds, but you can now access other systems, you can now compromise other systems, and well, the, the pipeline is not very useful at that point. What you can also do is inject backdoors within projects in a stealthy way, meaning that nothing would appear within the user interface of the Jenkins, but you could uh, very stealthily add malicious command or malicious code on all the projects that will go through the orchestrator. And the last one is poison the well. I talked about um, dependency confusion and dependency hijacking earlier, you could also try to obtain persistence within the information systems by compromising on or by pushing malicious packets uh, within the packet repositories in order to keep access within the information systems. So I will very uh, quickly provide a few feedback also of what we find on orchestrators. Quite often uh, we found poor access management. As I've said, the orchestrator is the most important part of your CI-CD pipelines. However, most of our clients don't really harden it well. And what we found, again, is sometimes a Jenkins with sign-up enabled, meaning that everybody could create an account on the Jenkins server. And another option, which was all the sign-up user, all the logging user, are administrator of the Jenkins. So you arrive, you create an account, and you've not successfully compromised the Jenkins server. What we've also found is logging too much. Uh, within the Jenkins server or any type of orchestrator, you usually have build logs. And within those build logs, we very, very often find secrets that are stored within it, allowing us, again, to escalate privilege within the Jenkins. And the last one is sometimes people still think that containers, that dockers, are a security solution and that it will help them to secure their pipeline. So what we found quite often is that the master server will have agents, and those agents are only containers run on the master server itself. And they think that since the agents are within containers, attacker will not be able to do anything. But I think you all know here that containers are not a security solution. And it's, I wouldn't say easy, but it's quite frequent that we are able to escape the containers and compromise the host system. So I just want to go very quickly over dependency poisoning and dependency confusion. So as I said earlier, you might want to poison the well to keep persistence within the information systems. So what it might look like is here on the left, uh, a developer wants to download for a project, uh, it will need to install a very public, rep uh, public package, okay? So you say, I want to download the latest version of the package called public package. At that point, what I've done as an attacker, since I've compromised the orchestrator, I've pushed a malicious version of the public package within the internal repository. 
meaning that when the user will try to download the public package, it will ask the internal repository, hey, internal repository, do you have the latest version of the public package? And the internal repository will say, oh, I have, yeah, I have a version locally, but I can check, I can check on the internet. I can check on the public repository. Well, the same version is, well, the same number version is available on the internet, but well, since I have it locally, it's always the local version that will be prioritized. So it's a great way to build persistence because it's very stealthy, it's low visibility, because the package, the, the attacker pushed on the internal repository is a working version of the package. It will not break anything, it will not come with any bug, it's just a compromised version of the package. Another thing you might have heard about is dependency confusion, which is a little bit different, which is a user wants to download an internal package. The package is available internally, but the attacker has, for some reason, no knowledge, because it found it in the documentation or something like that, that there is an internal package. It will push a malicious version of the internal package to the public repository, and the internal repository will be tricked into providing the malicious package coming from the internet to the internal user. So dependency poisoning is a great way to build persistence and it's very stealthy. Dependency confusion is a great way to obtain initial access, but it's very high visibility and high impact because the malicious package uh, downloaded from the internet is not a working version of the internal package. So the user might realize very quickly that something has gone wrong and say, okay, there is a problem and I need to find what's going on. Okay, so I just want to talk about this very quickly and we can, we can go back to what I was saying earlier about pivot out of the pipeline and maybe try to compromise other parts of the information system such as Kubernetes cluster and I'll let go to talk about that. So from the Jenkins, we could retrieve credential to deploy application within a Kubernetes. Uh, but uh, what is Kubernetes uh, firstly? Uh, actually, Kubernetes is a solution used mainly to deploy containered applications such as Docker application and to manage them throughout their life cycle. For instance, Kubernetes will handle uh, restarting your application whenever it crash or if you lose one of your cluster nodes. Um, it also has uh, some features to manage secrets, for instance, uh, and, and uh, networking. Um, Kubernetes is actually highly configurable and has uh, many protection to be secure. However, on the bare installation, it comes with none of this protection installed. So it is up to the cluster administrators to be aware of them and to properly configure them. And what we often see that it's not always the case during open test, so we will uh, go through some of the common and critical issue we often see during uh, uh, Kubernetes pen test. Um, for this uh, scenario, we are also considering uh, Kubernetes running within a um, cloud environment as it provides additional interaction with the cloud and so it increases the attack surface. The first common issue we see comes from the networking. Actually, by default, the inner network of the cluster is completely unfiltered. That means that one application may communicate with any other application within the cluster. So during a pen test, we can easily use that to scan the internal network and to get access to services and exploit vulnerabilities on them to get a footer on the other application. And this is interesting also because not only can we access services exposed to the outside of the cluster, but also uh, the services which are not. So it is very important to continue to order your container, uh, such like you would do also with your application server. It is also interesting when communicating to outside of the cluster. Uh, when one application tries to communicate with an external component, there are NAT mechanisms uh, which occur on the cluster node and uh, on the cloud environment, this can be exploited uh, on the instance metadata API. Uh, on cloud environment, this API is used to, for resources to retrieve information about themselves, uh, including cloud uh, credentials. 
and to know who is requesting uh, the information, the API based its choice on the source AP. So when one application tries to request this API, and thanks to the NAT, it all looks like the, the request come from one of the cluster nodes. And so one application may retrieve credential, um, the credential of one of the cluster nodes, and pivot them to, to AWS with its uh, privileges. So it is important to enforce uh, a filtering within the cluster thanks to the network policies which exist within the Kubernetes. The second common issue comes from the IAM. Like often with, um, with the policy management, whenever uh, permissive rights are given, we may uh, move and escalate quite easily. I won't dive deep in it because others has already done that, um, such as CyberArk, uh, but I will only tell you a few of the issues we commonly found. So the first issue we sometimes find, find is that uh, one application may require to, commun to interact with another application resources. And usually this is done through a uh, highly permissive uh, set of rights. And so we can easily exploit them to move laterally to this application. Another issue also comes with uh, Jenkins itself, actually. For sake of simplicity and because Jenkins is used to deploy several applications in several different contexts, uh, it is given uh, often a wide uh, set of rights on the whole cluster. And so just the credential of G Jenkins is usually, is usually enough to uh, compromise the whole cluster. In a cloud environment, also you may uh, give your application a set of rights on the cloud environment itself. So if you get access to one of these applications, you may retrieve the service accounts used, uh, used by the application and pivot once again to AWS and sometimes with uh, high privileges. So it is important to review your policies and like always to enforce the least principle, the least uh, privilege principle. Uh, and for that, there are some uh, tools which may be used uh, on the Kubernetes clusters such as Kubiscan or Crane. Last but not least is the lack of restriction of your, in your deployments. Actually, uh, when you deploy, you start an application within the Kubernetes cluster, you decide how this application should be running. And so you may decide which user will run your application, but also which set of capabilities you should give to your application, and even which uh, container isolation to enable or disable. So when one user is capable to uh, start a new process, a new application with no container isolation, it's quite easy to, to escape it, to uh, compromise the cluster node itself. And once you have compromised the cluster node, um, it's uh, easy also to get access to any resources within your Kubernetes cluster, such as uh, the secrets. You may also, as you are capable to run code on the uh, cluster node itself, you may once again pivot to AWS uh, uh, by requesting the uh, instance metadata API. So it is important to enforce a strict restriction in what your developers, DevOps, are allowed to start on your Kubernetes. And this is even more true because uh, only a partial um, uh, isolation is sufficient to, uh, to compromise the whole cluster. And on that, Bishop Foss already uh, did a thorough work and uh, described several attacks which can be done based on different set of uh, enabled uh, and disabled isolation. So we see here uh, three of the way to pivot to AWS, but there is one last thing I'd like to share on Kubernetes, is that Kubernetes uh, has all the capacities 
to be monitored and properly monitored. It, it has a complete audit policy and it also has several uh, compliance software which exist like Falco to at every moment ensure only secure uh, application are running within your, your cluster. So it is important to also um, set up uh, monitoring uh, of your clusters. So I will leave um, Remy continue on the AWS part. Okay, so inside the Kubernetes cluster, we found an AWS account. What could we do with it? To quickly understand a privilege escalation in AWS and then lateral movement, I need to quickly introduce how um, the identity access management works in AWS. It's quite simple. There is two major ways to delegate privilege in AWS. The first one is called direct attach. As its name, you define an IAM policy with the privilege and you attach these policies to an AWS identity. That could be a user, that could be a group, a virtual machine, a services, as you want. And then this identity uses security token to perform action inside the AWS. The second part is known as role-based. It's quite the same. You define that I am policies, you attach it to a role, and then an identity could assume this role to retrieve the privilege. You must know that the role delegation need be defined in both ways. First of all, the role have an assume policies that will define who could assume it. And the identity need to have the privilege to assume the role. So the delegation works in two uh, paths. So once we have an account in AWS, we could try to perform some enumeration. We were really lucky in that environment. We directly found a really high privilege that is pass four. This four is really interesting because it will allow you to pass and to share any role of the AWS account to a service. What is really interesting on that point is you could pass a role that have more privilege than your current account. It's always used to perform local privilege scalation inside an AWS account. So we exploit it with a lambda creation function. We pass another really privileged role attached to the policies in the IAM uh, privilege scalation. And then we grab the administrator access privilege it's like domain admins in uh, Active Directory world, and we take over this first account. You should know that there is actually around 25 different ways to perform a privilege validation and to abuse some privilege in AWS. I should recommend the really great blog post from Reno Security Labs. We will find the reference at the end. Once we have compromised this first AWS account that was used in the environment from the DevOps team, we should know that in AWS, there is not always only one account. There are several accounts into uh, a, a company to handle different criticality and different assets. This, all these accounts are put together into an AWS organization, and at the top at this, of this organization, you have a root account. This will have all the privilege over the whole organization and could go back on it. So we perform the enumeration again with your newly acquired privilege to find a way to bounce back on the root account. 
we found that role, a custom administrator role defined by the DevOps team uh, could assume another role into the root account. The name of this role was pretty easy to understand. It was like read-only I am policy in master accounts. So we assume this role and then we assume the other role into the root account. As his name, we had a lot of privilege, but only read-only privilege. We start again the enumeration, all the users, the war, the IAM policies, and we identified what we should compromise in it. Like, who is administrator access in the root account? We found several roles, but one bring our attention on it. Why? It's because inside these Asian policies, we found that an account from the DevOps account, a user from the DevOps account, could assume this role in the root account. So we bring back in the DevOps account, enumerate again, and check what is the monitoring role that could be used potentially to access the most privileged in the AWS organization. At that point, we find a little issue is the ASIUM policy of the monitoring roles is quite restrictive. It's allow only a really specific services of AWS to assume this role. It was the first problem, but actually we don't care because we are administrator of the DevOps account. So we could just update the assume policy, put our compromise role inside it, and steal the monitoring credential. And then we bounce into the root account and compromise it. Once we are administrator access in the AWS organization, we could access every account defined in the organization. In order to demonstrate the impact to our clients, we decided to find a way to pivot into the in-premise network. So we start our enumeration again, and we found an AWS account with all the Terraform and Ansible configuration and all the passwords defined inside. We grab them and we bounce back into the Active Directory world and compromise the Active Directory. We like to show with that kind of scenario that we could, for example, deploy ransomware, set up some backdoor to extract sensitive data, etc. There are three interesting measures to put in place inside AWS to harden it. The first one is not really easy. The IAM policies in AWS could be really complex. Uh, actually, you could define a policy with really uh, restrictive access, such as IP location, multi-factor authentication, uh, regex, regex on the name of the user, etc. So, I really miss a tool like Blowdown in AWS to create a big graph with all the configuration and see the interconnection between the world different AWS accounts. A few tools on, AW uh, on the open source uh, could try to do some stuff such as cloud splitting from Salesforce or Scoot Suite from NCC Group. The second point is to use and abuse from service control policies. This configuration will allow to define a master rules at the organization level that nobody could modify from the local account and to block, for example, some privilege or to avoid that someone could perform an action on sensitive assets that we will, could define thanks to really simple tag. This uh, service control policy are not readable by anyone outside the root access in the organization. So it's pretty hard to export an AWS configuration 
when you don't know what are the policy defined. And the last one is to define everything log everywhere, export them because uh, it's quite often that the log could expire in cloud providers such as Azure or AWS and after 30 days you lost everything and try to perform some dedicated correlation on it. You, there is really interesting rules in Grail Duty for example. Okay, so, so let's just take a step back. I, I'll go quickly because apparently I talk too much, so we're already a little bit late on schedule, but um, we wanted to take a, take a step back very quickly and look at the overall scenario. What I wanted to share with you is that we went very quickly from unauthenticated user within the information systems to, well, access to the repository, then poison pipeline execution, compromise of the orchestrator, and at that point, we had already access to production environment, which means that after steps four from step five, at that point, we could have real life impact on business application and basically compromise all the application within the company. Um, we didn't stop there. And as, as Gauthier and Remy showed you, we were able to go from the application deployment environment back to the office environment and the active directory, meaning that it was quite easy at that point to really compromise the whole information system. But even if that was not the case, we went very, very quickly from unauthenticated to access to production environment. Uh, last word I wanted to talk about that. As I said at the beginning, we had to focus on a very small set of tools. Uh, we think it really provides a picture of what is usually deployed in in our client's environment, but obviously there might be tons of different tools depending on your technical stack and so on. All those tools are great and usually have tons of functionalities and provide useful functionalities for the DevOps teams. I just want you to keep in mind that all those functionalities can't be also used by attackers. And the message behind, behind this uh, slide is to say that we feel that sometimes DevOps teams want to deploy new solution and new type of, uh, of solution before really hardening and before really understanding and managing existing solution. So our advice there would be fo maybe focus more on quality and uh, security level of your application before trying to deploy a new one. And I'll just let me finish on the few recommendations and that will have a few minutes for questions. If you should only remember five points about this talk. The first one is to ensure least privilege and to review your AM policy. To be honest, actually we should never found animus access on Jenkins, for example, or really critical privilege in AWS and all parts some random services. The second point is to focus on secret management. Password in career text are uh, really such things, but please, it's pretty easy to remove them. You could propose to use some vault on that point. I'm sorry for all the developers, but agility is great, is awesome, but agility could also be done with some procedure and some restriction to avoid to impact the world companies. The monitoring of the pipeline is always done in order to validate the availability of the pipeline and never to identify some uh, bad behavior or uh, exploitation, current exploitation inside it. You should really understand that code review is interesting for what is inside your pipeline, but you should also monitor the whole infrastructure that handle the pipeline and all this process. The last point is more about the architecture of this pipeline. You should segregate different environments inside it to avoid uh, basic uh, marketing application could compromise some really sensitive assets 
on your network. It's the same in the Kubernetes world. Network segregation is the key. And in AWS, you could set up so many features to segregate the rights in the accounts to ensure that even if an attacker put a foot inside, it will not be able to escalate his privilege. What I'd like to, to say in the last point is the CI-CD pipeline is not only a, a stuff for developers or application. It's, it could impact the world network and the world infrastructure behind. A few references before starting some question. We will find some really interesting stuff in the Metal Talk at Black Hat long years ago. Uh, I already speak about the Reno Security Labs around AWS privilege escalation. They also provide some Terraform code to deploy this misconfiguration and see what is done. Uh, the NCC group published uh, at the beginning of the year a really interesting blog post on CICD2. Uh, right after, we'll have the chance to uh, listen to Omar that uh, also speak about the most risk present in CICD pipeline. Uh, and I think what at the blog post I prefer, it's uh, from a free chat. Uh, definitely to take a look about hacking the cloud. There is also some really good reference from Bishop and CyberArch around uh, Kubernetes world. Thank you so much. And if you have a few minutes, only two. If someone has a question. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice day. Oh, no question. Not there, no question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Is question. there a question? Yeah. Uh, are, is there anything you can do to harden your pipeline so they can't be poisoned? Like, are there security settings that GitHub Actions or GitLab pipelines has that you could do to like, av you know, Prevent that. avoid that from happening or is it? So, so yeah, the, the problem with uh, poison pipeline execution is that it's not a vulnerability itself. It's the whole goal of the pipeline is to build the code into artifacts. So what you can do to try to prevent those things is uh, take advantage of uh, branch protection, uh, take advantage of, for example, what you could do is ensure that your build configuration file, I talked about the Jenks file earlier, you could put those build configuration file on another branch on which basically nobody can push and retrieve those files from that specific branch, meaning that you know that the build configuration file will never change. And even if an attacker were able to compromise an account, it would be able to compromise the code of the application, but not the build configuration file. So there are a few things that you can, you can set up. Honestly, they are not that easy to set up and it decreases the risk. But no, the, there's no way to magically prevent all poison pipeline execution, sadly. I would love to. <laughs> so you're suggesting that you could move the pipeline file all the all like the actions and stuff into its own repository or something like that just separating the, the exactly topics. basically the, the okay. thing that will contain the steps for your yeah. uh, builds you could put them in another it can be another branch or another place okay. on which you know that you can trust it and it will be less likely to be compromised yeah. so there are ways to <laughs> sure. limit the impact yeah. of poison pipeline yeah thank you no problem any other question huh? okay